So good morning, folks. Lovely to see you. A beautiful day today, isn't it? So lovely. I'm sure those of you who walked in or even drove in today to see the sun out. Beautiful, still, crisp, spring-like morning. Beautiful. So this morning is um, the first Sunday in the season of Lent. Ash Wednesday was this week and we've entered the season of Lent. And so our services over this season will be built around Lent themes as we also at the same time continue our uh, series in the book of Isaiah. So a little bit of a combination. And I want to just begin today by reading a couple of verses to frame Lent for us. I'm going to read these verses and then we'll just sit in silence, relative silence, relative stillness. Um, We'll just sit for a wee moment or two as we uh, prepare our hearts for our time of worship together. So it was the prophet Isaiah who in chapter 30 verse 15 said this, Thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. And Jesus in Luke 21, 36 said this, Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So in this time of preparation, preparation of our hearts for the things of Easter, let's just take a wee moment of stillness. Let's acknowledge that the living God is here. And let's very consciously orientate our hearts and our gaze onto him. Let's stand together. We're going to call each other to worship using the words on the screen. Your words are still in gold, so look out for those and speak them out with enthusiasm. Almighty God, you have built your church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone together. Join us together in unity of spirit that we may become a holy temple acceptable to you Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit today that we may build our lives together on Christ our rock. Let's sing together.
that you've gone before us, that you lead us on, and Lord, our future is certain and sure because of what Jesus has done. Lord, I pray that that hope would grip us and we would be people of hope, not only at this time together, but Lord, when we get back into our lives Monday through to Saturday, Lord, would we have that hope in our hearts and would we share that hope with others. Lord, grip us with that hope this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our seats. Thanks, guys, for introducing us to that beautiful song. Really appreciate it. 
Just a wee reminder of that a little bit later on, there'll be an opportunity to share what God's been doing in our lives. We call it God Uncenses. So have we think, uh, maybe if you haven't shared before today, today you think, you know what, I'm just going to share a wee bit of what God's been up to. So there's an opportunity coming up in a little minute or two. I'm going to have a time of prayer this morning. And because we've stepped into the season of Lent together, we're going to watch a short video which reminds us of the transformation that Christ's sacrifice brings. We've already been introduced to that theme through the, the words of the song we've just been singing, but we're going to think more about all that Jesus has won for us because he walked that path of sacrifice to the cross, which is the season we're in. So we'll watch the video, and then again, we're just going to have a moment or two of silence for you to pray and for you to realign yourselves to God, okay? As usual, I'm going to have to faff around here for a moment or two. So excuse the fast and then watch the video. steps of Christ. Living God, thank you for the path of sacrifice which you chose out of sheer love for us. Lord, out of love for you, would we also walk in your footsteps? And Lord, over this season particularly, would you help us to be faithful to you and walk the path of sacrifice? And Lord, as we walk that path, we pray that you would put something in us, that you would change our hearts, that we would love you and love others more dearly. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
Have we opportunity then to share some God incidences? Sonia has the mic. Has anyone got anything to share this week? Naomi, thank you. It's just a wee small one, but it's quite good. <laughs> um, on a Thursday, I, it's probably my busiest day um, in terms of going around different schools. and I'm in three different schools. So uh, I have, my first school is on the Ravenhill Road, and then I've got like 10, 15 minutes to get to Botanic Primary, um, which is fine because it's only a mile down the road, but anybody who knows that area knows that it is awful for parking. And the school have virtually no space for cars to park in it. So I was driving up and every week it's like, oh, am I going to get a space anywhere close to the school? And I was driving up and I was like, oh, please just let me get a good space. <laughs> just somewhere that I don't have to walk too far. And I got a space right opposite the school. <laughs> and that yes. never happens. <laughs> ever, ever happens. And it was just like, oh. Do you know? Because um, some days you're like driving round and round and round for like five minutes trying to find a space. So it was just a wee small thing, but it was Absolutely. quite good. The big and the small, Naomi, thank you for sharing that. We thank you, God, that you're interested in every detail of our lives. Miriam. Um, this is for Daniel, and he wanted me to say that Jesus helped him to be kind this week. Brilliant. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing that. Fantastic. Anyone else? Sonia, as you've got the mic, would you thank God for those two things and thank you both for sharing. Lord, we just thank you that you're with us in every part of our days and weeks, Lord, the big things and the small. Thank you that you care about the frustrations of things like parking spaces and um, that you're with us in those. And thank you for that place just opposite the school this week. And Lord, also that you are with us in our responses and reactions to other people. Um, and you work in us, however old we are, whether we're really tiny or whether we've been on this earth for decades, Lord, thank you for Daniel's just opportunity to be kind this week. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that you'd continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit and enable us to be kind and respond well to others. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, we want it's time for you to go out to your groups. So Sunday school age kids, primary school age kids, out the door to your right. And we want crash age kids out the door to your left. And as they go out, our band are going to come up and to lead us in another song, Good, Good Father. So God bless you. Come back and tell your parents or carers everything you've learned about today. Have a good wee chat about it over lunch. Let's stand together as we continue in worship.
heartless pain, a peace, a soul, a unexplainable life can hardly think as you call me, a deeper still as you call me, a deeper still as you call me. continue our walk through Isaiah today. We're in chapter 28 and we're going to begin our reading at verse 14. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. You boast we have entered into a covenant with death, with the realm of the dead we have made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us. For we have made a lie our refuge, and falsehood our hiding place. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line, and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie and water will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. Your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge sweeps by, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it comes, it will carry you away, morning after morning, by day and by night, it will sweep through. The understanding of this message will bring sheer terror. And then we drop down to verse 24. When a farmer plows for planting, does he plow continually? Does he keep on breaking up and working the soil? When he has leveled the surface, does he not sow caraway and scatter cumin? Does he not plant wheat in its place, barley in its plot, and spelt in its field? His God instructs him and teaches him the right way. Caraway is not threshed with a sledge, nor is the wheel of a cart rolled over cumin. Caraway is beaten out with a rod and cumin with a stick. Grain must be ground to make bread, so one does not go on threshing it forever. The wheels of a threshing cart may be rolled over it, but one does not use horses to grind grain. All this also comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, whose wisdom is magnificent. This is the word of the Lord. And who better man to speak on that passage than our own Wesley. So Wesley, come and join us. And we'll pray for you and pray for us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for this prophecy of Isaiah, Lord, and all of the truth and wisdom that's packed into it. And living God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come upon us now, and as we look at this particular passage, would you illuminate it for us, Lord? Would you shine your light into it and into our lives as a result? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Rose. Morning, everybody. Uh, last summer, um, and it's nice to see the sunshine coming back again this year, but last summer we bought our son Patrick a 
a Nerf gun to play with. Now, most of you, I think, know what that is, but just in case you're not, it's basically a toy that shoots out little foam pellets at high speed. And the toy came with about 12 of these little pellets. And he ran out into the garden of the house we were in and fired the first shot straight over the fence into the neighbor's garden. And the second one, he fired up onto the roof where it got stuck in the gutter. And within half an hour, all but one of his little foam pellets was lost. And poor Patrick had to face up to one of the key facts that we all have to learn, which is that actions have consequences. Patrick discovered in a trivial sort of way that actions have consequences. Now, I did advise him several times not to fire his gun over the neighbor's fence, um, not to fire his gun up onto the roof, but he ignored me and did it anyway. And he no longer had enough foam pellets to play with and that frustrated him and he expressed that frustration. Now, could I have stopped him from firing them over the hedge? Yes, I could. I could have done that by taking the toy off him. Um, If I'd done that though, he wouldn't have learned anything and plus he'd have lost something good which I wanted him to enjoy. So the consequences that he suffered were a combination of him ignoring my advice and me looking out for his long-term best interests. So how does that apply to the passage we read? Well, earlier in this series on Isaiah, Ross explained some of the historical background to this part of the story. But in summary, there were three nations, one of which was Assyria, who had formed an alliance against Judah. Assyria was the most powerful nation in the entire region. And Judah was a relatively tiny nation potentially facing a huge army that wanted to invade them and take over their territory. Now God had already told the people of Judah through Isaiah that he would keep them safe from the nations who threatened to invade if they trusted him. But instead the rulers of Judah decided to form a military alliance with Egypt, the second most powerful country in the region, in the assumption that Egypt's large army could keep the Assyrians at bay. In other words, the people have chosen not to trust God's promise to keep them safe, but to instead trust the Egyptian army. Isaiah parodies what they have done in verse 15. He says, you boast we have entered into a covenant with death and the realm of death we have made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us, for we have made a lie our refuge and falsehood our hiding place. Now the lie and the falsehood that Isaiah refers to in these verses is this idea that an earthly army is more trustworthy than the promises of God. They have put their refuge in a lie rather than the one true God. Now as we've seen, actions have consequences. God through Isaiah warns them that this decision is going to bring great harm to them. This is what he says. He says, your covenant with death will be annulled. Your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge sweeps by, you will be beaten down by it. There will be a judgment on their decision. And even the mighty armies of Egypt will not be able to prevent it from happening. This is a judgment they've brought on themselves. And one that God will not prevent happening. Firstly, because it was their own free choice and God respects our free will. And secondly, because unfortunately the nation needs to learn the vital lesson that a decision not to trust God has consequences. Isaiah is clear. We ignore the spiritual realities of our world at our peril. Now we need to pause here, I think, and acknowledge that this is something a lot of us are uncomfortable with, isn't it? We don't really like the idea that our actions are constrained in this way. Some of us are even offended by the idea that the universe has spiritual realities that we didn't sign up for and yet are bound by, whether we like it or not. And this is because the culture around us equates freedom with an absence of rules. Through our TV, through our popular music, through our public debate, we're constantly exposed to this idea that freedom means freedom from restrictions, 
the freedom that freedom means being able to live our lives exactly as we want without anyone judging us or imposing restrictions on us. But that's not the biblical idea of freedom. Now, there's a whole sermon in this I wish I could go into, but we don't have time this morning. But the Bible is clear that the limitations that God places us in the Bible, in places like the Ten Commandments, for example, are for our own benefit. They're not there because God somehow loves creating rules and then eagerly sits and watches to see if we break them. They're there because real freedom, the freedom for us to fully become who God intended us to be, can only exist when there are restrictions. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, take an example of two families with children. Family A imposes rules on their children. So, bedtime is seven o'clock. We must eat together as a family. You must not play with the toys in the shed. You can only have fizzy drinks as a treat. You have to do your chores every day. Family B, on the other hand, thinks this is a really primitive, restrictive idea. They want their kids to have freedom, so they have no rules. The kids can go to bed whenever they like. They can eat in front of the TV. They can play with the sharp tools in the shed. They can drink as many fizzy drinks as they want. Now, which set of children do you think will thrive more? A. Family A, of course. Those children have rules that are designed to keep them safe, physically healthy, and mentally balanced. Children in family B are more likely to get injured, get lonely, uh, suffer from lack of sleep, and become unhealthy. The rules in family A are not there to restrict the children, they're there to enable them to thrive. Let's take another quick example of how the idea that real freedom means an absence of rules is silly. We all experience rules all the time in the physical world, don't we? If you jump out an upstairs window, you will soon learn that the law of gravity is not to be trifled with. And by and large, even our culture here in the West accepts this, doesn't it? You know, people here do not go around complaining that the law of gravity is unfair because it robs them of the choice of leaving their house by an upstairs window. No, we, we accept the reality. And in the last part of our passage, this is what Isaiah was getting at when he was talking about farming. You know, we just accept that you have to do certain things certain ways. So we adapt to the reality. We make sure we leave our houses at ground level. We adapt to the physical rules of the universe in which we live. We don't ignore them. Now, the Bible is clear that the universe isn't just a physical place. There's an active spiritual realm behind the physical realm that we can see and touch. And since we accept the reality of physical realities with their limitations, isn't it logical that in the spiritual realm there must be restrictions too that we must respect to thrive? We can't simply do whatever we like in spiritual terms and imagine there will be no consequences and no impact on our relationship with God. Imagine that God had created a universe with absolutely no spiritual restrictions whatsoever. In this universe, it's fine to steal. It's okay to kill. Ignoring God is no problem. It's fine to work seven days a week and never take a Sabbath. It's okay to neglect your father and mother. That would be a universe with fewer rules, all right. But would you want to live there? I don't think so. It sounds like a recipe for a nightmare. But God is a loving God, and he loves his children, and he wants to see us thrive. And so he not only created a universe with a spiritual realm and spiritual rules, but one in which he told us what they are through the Bible. Clearly, he wants us to thrive. He wants to have what Jesus called life in all its fullness. Just like family A, who have rules for their children, the spiritual restrictions that we have are for our own benefit. And because God is not a loving God, he is not going to give up on the people of Judah, despite their catastrophic mistake in trusting the armies of Egypt rather than trusting God. So he will make sure that a remnant will survive, which God will use to build something better. In verses 16 and 17, Isaiah reports the words of God like this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, 
a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a firm foundation, a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. Now Zion refers to Jerusalem or perhaps more specifically the temple, the place where God is worshipped. And the cornerstone represents a firm foundation which will be characterised by justice and righteousness. And whoever relies on this firm foundation will never be stricken with panic. How many of us right now have felt a rising sense of anxiety when we watch the news with conflicts taking place around the world and things that we value apparently under real threat? God is saying that if we put our ultimate trust in him, if we make his stone the foundation of our lives, then we will not panic when these things happen because we know that ultimately the world is in God's hands and that one day he will make all things new and bring us to live with him forever. Now, this was a powerful enough message for the people of Judah at that time, but we have the advantage of being able to look it back look back from centuries in the future where we can see the perfect fulfillment of the cornerstone that God laid, laid in Zion. In First Peter, Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So who is the precious cornerstone? Jesus is the chosen and precious cornerstone that God set in Zion. And each of us who is a Christian is a stone built on that foundation, the one foundation that can never be shaken. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Jesus, as he said in the Bible, did not come to abolish the law and prophets, he came to fulfill them. Before we finish, let's get practical. Um, in this season of Lent, particularly, and as Ross said earlier, we need to think about what this means for us Monday to Saturday. What does this mean for each of us in concrete terms in the week ahead? Now, most of us here in St. John's are not facing a danger as extreme as an invading army, although many people in the world are. But it's likely that in the coming week, we will all face situations where, to one degree or another, we are tempted to ignore the spiritual reality of the world. And the lesson from Isaiah is this. We can't do that without risking our relationship with God and perhaps even our eternal destiny. Actions have consequences. Let me give an example. During the working week, I'm a businessman. We run a business publishing books. That's why Ross gets me to do so much of the printing and stuff in here. Um, now, surprisingly often, for people who aren't in business, there are opportunities to make a bit more money, not by breaking the law, not even by telling lies, but simply by being less than fully transparent. Last year, a printing company did a job for me. They printed a large pallet of about a thousand books to a value of several thousand pounds, but they never invoiced me for them. And after a time, I realized that it must have fallen through their system and they probably weren't going to invoice me. So there was a clear temptation to say nothing and make several thousand pounds profit. Now, if the physical world was your only consideration, you would probably say, well, it's not my job to chase invoices. If they want to do themselves out of money, well, that's their problem. Bad luck to them. But that approach doesn't sit comfortably with me because of what I know of God's character and goodness. In Leviticus, it says, do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights and honest ephah and an honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And that last sentence is key. Yes, this is saying that we should be honest, but being honest doesn't just mean not being dishonest. It also means being honest in a proactive way because God is God. 
And honesty is part of his character, and so it should be part of ours too. Now, I would love to be able to stand up here and say that this invoice issue was an easy problem for me to resolve, but I'll admit it was not. I mulled this over for several days, swinging between the ways the problem looked from the perspective of the physical world and the perspective of the spiritual world. And the temptations to gain several thousand pounds of free cash without even having to tell a lie was very real. In the end, I took advice from a couple of Christian friends and they helped me to see that this was plainly an issue of where I placed my ultimate trust, where was my cornerstone. Which did I care about more? Obtaining money that I knew I wasn't entitled to or living with integrity before an audience of one? Jesus summed up the dilemma quite neatly in Matthew. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I had to choose. So, somewhat reluctantly, I emailed the boss of the company and pointed out to him that they'd forgotten to invoice me. He thanked me and shortly after an invoice arrived which I paid. But afterwards, I had total peace about that decision. The world has a spiritual reality which we ignore at our peril. If I had not lived as if that was a fact, I would have harmed my relationship with God by taking my faith away from him and placing it in the physical things of this world. So let's think about who our cornerstone really is. Let's remember in this coming week that we are living our lives for an audience of one. Make sure that the stone at the very basis of our lives that we've built everything else on is Jesus and not anything else in this world. Remember that nothing, not wars, not earthquakes, will ever shake our relationship with, with Jesus if he is our foundation. Have you chosen to build your life on Jesus and have a relationship with God that can't be shaken? If not, why not do it today? Speak to me or Ross or one of the prayer ministry team after the service. But let's end with a promise that God makes through Isaiah later in the book, in Isaiah 54. He says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And I think there are some people today who need to hear those words. The Lord has compassion on you. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you placed your cornerstone in the person of Jesus Christ. Help us this day and in the days ahead to choose to build our lives on you afresh each day. Please, will you particularly help us when we are faced with the temptation to put our ultimate trust in something else before you. Help us to choose you. We ask this in your strength and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're going to continue to worship God um, by singing.
our seats. Thanks, guys. And thanks, Wesley, for that great, great talk. Really, really appreciated that. Very helpful. Um, just before we get on to the notices, um, every time we uh, meet together, we meet at half nine just to pray for the service. And we always take time to ask God, is there anything on your heart for the, the services to follow? And today, um, we're reminded of that psalm where God says about going up the holy hill, in other words, drawing closer to him, and that those who can do that are those with clean hands and a pure heart. But then the psalm goes on to say those who speak truth, those who speak righteously. Just on the back of what Wesley was sharing about that situation in work where he spoke the truth, just feel God underlining that and that there's a situation facing somebody where they know they need to speak out the truth, similarly to Wesley, and you're just imming and ahhing about it. If that does sit with you, just encourage you. Heard what Wesley said, the example of there's a spiritual realm that's really important, and that we need to be those who, when God speaks to us and shows us the ways of righteousness, that we walk in those ways. So if there's a situation that you're facing where you know that you need to speak the truth and you've been umming and ahhing, why don't you talk it through with us? Why don't you receive prayer? Why don't you act on that? And Wesley, thanks for that really useful example. A few of you notices, over Lent, we have a Praying at Home initiative. So we're encouraging people to commit to pray for one hour on a particular day during Lent. Thank you for those who prayed this last week. This coming week, every slot is full, which is great. But don't put, make that put you off. You think, I want to pray this week. Just add your name alongside others. You know, we can have 30 people praying in one day. That would be awesome. So um, if that's something that you want to do, then do please sign up either this week or for one of the following slots. But let's make sure that we're praying over this period. There are prayer pointers to help you. Little yellow sheet, pick that up if you want to join in that initiative. Also, if you've been watching the wee transformations videos from the diocese, they're good. Helen has good old Helen. They're good. So they're about, I don't know, two or three minutes, five minutes maybe of different things that God's been doing across the diocese. So have a wee watch at those, be encouraged, and then share them. If you think, yeah, that is good, then share them with those people uh, who you're friends with on Facebook. This is the last day where you can be added onto the register of vestry persons. <laughs> the tension. I'm sure you'll live through it. So, if you want to be added to the Register of Vestry Persons, which means that come the Easter General Vestry, you can vote and you can stand for office. And why would you not do those things? Then do fill in those forms today. And Vestry people, remember we're meeting at the end of the 11.30 service, just to go over those people who want to be added to the Register. Quick look at what's happening this week. Prayer Club Tuesday night. Not in the Rectory this week. Ignore the Rectory bit. Not in the Rectory, just on Zoom. If you come to our house, Kezi will just say hello at the door and then shut it again because we're not around. So just online this week, but you can join in the prayer club. And if you want the codes for that, then let me know and I'll send you those. Holy Communion Wednesday morning as normal, 10 o'clock next door. Wednesday night, sanctuary course at 7.30 as normal in the Duffin Rooms. Tots at 10 o'clock also on Friday. Friday the 3rd of March, there's the Women's World Day of Prayer for this year. It's in St. Finian's Parish Church at 8 p.m. This year the prayer material is written by the ladies of Taiwan. So if you want to join with others, not just ladies, men and women, it's done by ladies, but it's for everybody. If you want to join with others to pray um, for various things written by the ladies of Taiwan, this Friday, St. Finian's 8 p.m., do join in. Story and song next Sunday. We're really looking forward to it, aren't we, Neil? We really are. So Neil is going to be speaking next Sunday, sharing a wee bit about his God story. And it's a time of worship. And then we hear a little bit of uh, Neil's faith story. We look forward to that. That's 8 o'clock next Sunday. Further afield on St. Patrick's Day, uh, the diocese have a whole range of activities centered around Down Patrick. So if you are interested in joining in with others across the diocese, the Bishop of Rwanda is coming and there's a particular focus on reconciliation, which we really need to hear as, uh, in this country. 
So if you're interested, pick up this little card and on the back you have the programme. It begins at 9.30 in Saul, uh, in Saul Little Church, just in the outskirts of Van Patrick. Really good to join in those things with others in the diocese. Nearly there. There's lots of notices today, isn't there? On March the 20th, so just after St. Patrick's Day, there is a, another Cayley. Some of you were Cayley and like mad during our family festival. Now you've got your practice in, you can join with the professionals. Castlereagh Scottish Country Dance Class Cayley is happening in our halls, 7.45 on March the 20th. The admission is free, there's food provided, but they want to know how many are coming because of the food. So if you do want to go, pick up a ticket on the way out today, only if you're going, so that Anne will know how many are coming along. You got it? It's free, but you need to pick up that ticket so that we know you're going along. All clear? Yes. Thanks, Wes. All right, let's stand together as we finish. Prayer to your left. Don't be in a rush away. Have a wee bit of time together. Go and have a coffee, have a yarn with each other. And uh, let's close in prayer. Let us return to our God and to God's ways. For our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and full of compassion and mercy. So go from here with joy and confidence to love and serve the Lord. For the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit goes with us. Amen. Amen. Lovely to see you. See you soon.